Well, good morning, and God bless you. How is everyone? Welcome to Life Church of Orange. We want to welcome you this morning, this beautiful October fall morning. Thank you for joining us in the sanctuary, and thank you for joining us online this morning. God bless you. We're excited to be together in God's house. Amen. I want to encourage you this morning from God's word. And this is in Psalm uh, 150. It's the final psalm. So let's listen to this this morning. Hallelujah, it says. I'm reading from the Message Bible. Praise God in his holy house of worship. Praise him under the open skies. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his magnific magnificent greatness. Praise with a blast on the trumpet. Praise by strumming of soft strings, which we have. Praise him with the castanets and dance. Praise him with the banjo and flute. Praise him with cymbals and a big bass drum. Praise him with fiddles and the mandolin. Let every living, breathing creature praise God. Hallelujah. Are you a living, breathing creature? Let's stand to our feet. If you're a living, breathing creature, which God has created, he's given us breath. Amen. He's given us the ability to praise him. And you're going to say, wait, I should praise him in the middle of a pandemic? Yes. Yes, you should. Absolutely. So let's, let's praise him in the sanctuary this morning. Amen. Thank you, Becky and Jordan. Lead us out. Fill my heart with joy, drawing water from salvation's well. You are my strength and song, in the desert I still hold on. Emptiness restored, springs of mercy from the Lord. The love I've been redeemed, no longer lost, Lord, I am free, so I'll be Our God, He saves. 
to give the praise, church. Come on, we bless your name, oh God. Oh, we're going to tell the world that our lips will praise you, oh Father God. That our mouths will sing praises to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for who you are and what you've done. We thank you for what you're doing, Father God. We may not always see it, but we thank you, God, that you are always working. You go before us and you are always behind us. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you, Father God. We praise you, Lord. Our lips will praise you, Father God. Our hearts will praise you, Father God.
working for you right now. See God on your side right now as you're lifting up your praise to him. Praise him through your storm. Come on, see him working on your behalf. He goes before you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Come on, there's more that is for us than those that are against us. Yeah. I know the story, I, I think it was Elijah. And his servant was like, was afraid and he was like, what are we gonna do? There's a great vast army against us. And he took him out and he said, go ahead and look up on the mountains and look up on the hills right now. And he saw in, in like the spirit visions of armies and armies and chariots and that were there fighting on their behalf. Come on, see it right now in your situation, in your storm. See that God is fighting for you because why? Because he loves you because his mercy is upon you, because he has plans for you. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to do good things. He wants the blessings to be upon you. He rewards those who diligently seek him. Come on. Come on, see him fight for you right now. Oh, we praise you, we praise you. See you break down every wall. We Come on. watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we Come pray. Come on, we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we praise you.
Hallelujah, Lord. Bless you, Lord. You know, God, one more. Oh, I'm going to give you no, give one more song. I just want to say, God, God's got one thing to say to you today. God says, those who have ears, listen. And what he's saying is that he has a word for each one of you today. It's not going to be spoken by me. You have to listen. God wants to anoint your ears to begin to hear his voice in your life. You need to be able to hear what God is saying to you directly without relying on somebody else. Or it's somebody else you, you least expect it. I've said before many times, God has sounded just like my wife. Sometimes God has sounded just like the, the teller at the bank. You listen for the voice of God to give you the answers you need to go on. There's times when we are alone and we need to hear from God. So God says today, he has a word for every one of you. When you leave this place, God has had a word for every one of you. You need to listen. And when you hear it, you will know it. Amen? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you.
to those around me. You stay in that attitude. Let the Spirit of God just speak to your heart today. These are words of life to remind you that we're not alone. God made a promise that He'd never leave us, nor would He ever forsake us. God is not concerned about skin color. He's not concerned about what your last name is. He's not concerned about so many things. He's just concerned that you know of His love. God wants you to know of His love. Everything is wrapped in His love. It's all in His heart for you. Today, He's reminding you in our worship that He's with you. If you're grieving, if you're overwhelmed, don't panic. God has a peace to give you today. He has a, he give you a, a, a vision of hope and the future he has for you. Lord, we just praise you today. We, we, we love to worship you. We thank you, Lord, that you have put your Holy Spirit upon us today to remind us that we are not lost souls. We are members children of God and members of the kingdom of God we're not of this world but we're in it and you have showed us how to live in this world with God so we can show a fallen world there's hope that God resides and God is waiting to embrace so we give you the praise today we worship your name there is no other name like you there's no one equal to you let this is the day that the Son of God is to be glorified on this earth and in the lives of His kids. So we give you the praise right now. We worship you right now. We lift up your voices and tell Him how much you love Him. Just give Him a moment here to hear your voice. Ah, tell Him how much you, you appreciate Him. Show Him your appreciation. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. We worship you, Lord
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Sometimes it's good to be silent in the presence of the Lord. It's good to listen. We need to be good listeners. As they say, they gave us two ears. That means we listen twice as much as we talk. So... It's good to listen to God because he's speaking. We praise you today, Father, for this time of worship. And Father, we just surrender to the Spirit of God. We're not going to stop worship until the service is over and we've gone home, and we're even going to continue to worship you then, Father. Just to be in your presence, God, is so awesome. Thank you for this wonderful day. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. Give him a hand clap. Wow, you may be seated if you want to. You can stand up, though, if you want. I'm going to stand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, Amen. and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Good to see all your faces. Good to see you. Thank you. It's better than being in any bar in town, right? Or they don't let you in anymore, do they? <laughs> it's probably pretty good. Oh, yeah. All you lovely faces on Facebook. And later, those lovely faces that will see us on YouTube. Welcome. Life Church of Orange. In case you didn't know it, I'm Pastor Glenn. I know some of you know that. It hasn't been that long that you've forgotten our names. <laughs> I forget my name sometimes. This is called the uh, Life Church of Orange Financial Report. <laughs> Dow Jones is up. The other one's down. One went sideways. I don't know. They're still around. God is still on the throne. Amen. And we're still here. Amen. Lovers of faith. Today we're going to take the tithes and offerings. That's what we call it, right? It's so much more than that. Like I shared last week, it's a giving of grace. It's all wrapped in God's grace and God's love. So your giving is a work of faith. You know what? I need my glasses because I'll be reading by faith. <laughs> you know, like I said, I have not memorized this yet. The only thing I memorize is the fact that I have to give the tithes and offering today. Hey, look at that. I wasn't it reading upside down. Your giving is a work of faith. Any kind of acknowledgement of God, of course, is a work of faith. It's not a mental or an emotional provocation to give today. Your faith provokes you to give today. It's your love and your respect for God that moves you, is it not? Doesn't the love of God move you and compel you to, to press into him? See, you are compelled by your faith to give, and that pleases God. Because uh, Hebrews 1.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So know that your giving today is provoked by your faith. And if that's provoking you, God is pleased with you today. Hebrews 13.16 says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The Message Bible says it this way, God's God takes particular pleasure in acts of worship. Ties your giving in with worship. See, we're still worshiping. Yeah. You continue to worship in his presence. Yeah. It is, what you, is it what you give to God that pleases him? The answer to that is no. It's your faith in giving that pleases God. You subject your will to your faith, and you show your act of love by giving. The amount you give just simply reveals a larger faith than usual. So, you know, I, I guess I got to say welcome to the adventure of giving by faith, right? In Luke 6.38, it says give. Big, bold letters, give, and you will receive. See, that's how it works. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Wow. 
running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. That's, that's Bible. That's not me. I'm not one of these uh, faith teachers on giving and money and all that stuff. That's just, that's word. That's, that's God. Yes. You give and I'll give back. You know why? Because God says, if I can trust you with that, I'm going to give you more. Yes. And if I can trust you with that, I'm going to give you more. And it's okay. Everything you need will be taken care of. Right. But see, that's how we work with God. This isn't where God says you will do it or else. God leaves it up to us. But he says, I'll work with you. Is this a good thing? To work with God. Not just for God, but to work with God. Because there's a lot of things God won't do because he's expecting you to do it. So it'll never get done. Giving's one of those things. So giving is, like I said last week, it's, it's part of God's grace. We give out of a grace in our heart, not a mandate in our brain. Amen? Amen. That's good, Glenn. Thank you. Yeah. Pat myself on the back. God is simply saying here that, that when you are motivated by your faith in God to give, God is pleased, and this is how he shows his pleasure, by returning blessings back to you financially. Because of, if God is pleased because of your, your sacrifice of faith, then he is moved to entrust to you more, so you will have more to give. God supplies all your needs, and he will give you the need, the seed, excuse me, the plant. So remember when it says the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. We look in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 in the Amplified. It says, now remember this. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he who sows generously, that blessings may come to others. There's an additive right there inserted in there. You give generously. Why? Because others will be blessed by your giving. See, when you give to the church, people are being blessed. But what God has given us to give back. Amen. It's not only paying the bills and that, but you know what? There's, we have missions. Yeah. We have people that need food. We have access to all this stuff. And all this we have access to to bless other people is because you gave, and you gave because you want us to do that. Yeah. You don't sit there and give to us and say, just go eat bonbons and watch soap operas all day <laughs> and keep the doors open just in case we need you. That's not why you give to us. You give because in your heart... You have the uh, love of God and the grace of God, and you give to us, so you trust us to make sure other people are being blessed. I'm, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I get an amen on that? Yeah. Okay. So I don't have to assume on that one. I know you guys. The Lord is pleased because of your faithful giving. He is motivated to match your giving amount as well. If you are motivated by generosity, then so is God. So, again, a big thank you goes out to all of you. I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy when I see, uh, you know, when Pastor Gabe shares with us the financial thing, we look at it, we're healthy because you're healthy. Amen. Have such awesome, faithful Amen. family here, and I'm grateful for that. Amen. So, I tried this last week, and I blew it last week because I didn't have my notes. This is how you can give online there. If you're here, there's that little box in the back. I just dropped mine in there. If you're on the web, you can lifeoc.org and you can give on that line or you can use the church center app and you'll find a link to us and you can give on there or you can give this where I really blew it last week the, the address you can send it into 3514 each East Chapman Avenue 92869 that's in orange hallelujah huh well father we thank you I thank you Lord that everyone is given they're, they're stirred by faith and the love for you and you have already told them, and you will. you will. You will multiply their giving because you can trust them with what you put in their hands. And we give you the praise now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. And here's Pastor Gabe. All right. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. God bless you all. So glad to see you here in God's house. So... Uh, it's good. You know, I, I have my back to everybody worshiping God, so I turn around and see everybody. So it's good to see all the faces. <laughs> so God bless you. Um, hey, just a couple of, well, actually one item here I wanted to share with you. So um, T our own Tina Skaggs, wave your hand back there, Tina. Hey, amen. S soon to be Tina Burrell. Uh -huh. So I uh, coming up here in 2021, her and Michael. 
Um, so uh, what she has presented is uh, she works at uh, West Coast University. Uh, it's a nursing school, right? Is that a good way to describe it? So it's a nursing school. And so there's an opportunity for anybody who's interested. Um, they have a program called Telehealth, which is an educational consultation service for discussion about health concerns. So anybody, they're asking for help basically. They need uh, people who will be willing to volunteer um, and, and to help with the nurses that are being trained. So it's not that you're gonna be a guinea pig or anything like that, but if you are interested, the, there is a couple of, of issues, uh, but the nurses need their hours to graduate, and so they're asking if they can get volunteers to come, and, and um, so it's kind of, of bringing, letting the nurses train with you, basically. 30 minutes of your time uh, to give to a classroom uh, is what they're asking for. They also, you, you do need to have your own insurance Right, so it's not, it's not like if you don't have insurance, you can go do it, that's not what it is. But not that they're gonna ask you for your insurance, but it's just one of the requirements. So uh, Tina is uh, saying give her a call. Is that, is that, am I hearing that right? Or email. Or you can talk with her immediately after service if you're interested in volunteering uh, to uh, help them out here. So I wanted to give you that message. It's just a, a, a blessing that what we have here in the church family, and, uh, but they're also asking for help if you're interested in uh, donating yourself in that way, you know, but uh, to help train nurses there at the school. All right, so if any questions, please see Tina about that, and uh, we can be a blessing to them, to the school there. Uh, amen. amen. All right, praise God. So we're going to get into God's word here this morning. And uh, we're going to be here in the end of 1 Peter, starting in verse 22. And then we're going to touch on the very beginning of 1 Peter chapter 2 as well. So what I want to get in our hearts here, a true mark of a Christian, a true mark of, of being somebody who follows Jesus, is to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. That, that's how we know. This is what Jesus says. This is what the Word of God says. How we're differentiated from everybody else. Not only that we love God and obey Him and follow Him, but is that we love our neighbor as ourselves. That we love others the same way that, that we care for ourselves, love ourselves. And this is a mark of a Christian. According to Jesus, when you extend this all the way out, it includes even having love for an enemy. That can be hard to, to grasp right up front, especially when you're thinking about an enemy, when you're thinking about somebody who has not nice to you, when somebody who's hurt you or done you wrong, and when you understand that what Jesus says, that even to love your enemies, that can be difficult. Now, to do so is part of what it looks like to obey the truth. To Even to love your neighbor is what it looks like to obey the word of God, to obey what Jesus says. And this also is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is about because the gospel changes us. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that's how God changes our heart. The power of the gospel, the power of the message through the Holy Spirit changes us to what we formerly were, to what God has made us now in Christ Jesus. Now, 1 Peter teaches us that when we love, or as the Word of God says, agape, unconditionally love His people, it is the fruit of a purified soul because of our obedience to the truth, because we're following the truth of God's Word. That means we're listening to God's Word. That means we're taking in God's Word. That's, that means we're reading God's Word. We're consuming it. We're eating it. We're, we're, we're making it a part of our lives. And Peter sums all of this up today by saying that as a child of God, if you have tasted the goodness of the Lord, if you have tasted the kindness of the living God, if you've tasted that God is gracious, therefore live like it and how you treat others. If you've really tasted the graciousness of God and how he's been gracious to you, then live like it by how you treat one another, by how you respond, by how you love each other the way Jesus says that we should love each other. Now, God calls us to be a people who obey his word, and his word is the truth. It's not an obedience to mere words devised by people 
or, or what, may some, what some may hold as truth. So that's the difference about us as Christians. What we obey, we're not obeying just somebody's idea that they came up with and they're just so smart that they put all these concepts together. No, we're obeying the word of God. That's what differentiates us from every other religion is that we are adhering to the word of God. We're obeying the words that came from God to us. And this is what we live by. And so in this, and, and as we obey his truth, this is where we find the life of God. This is where we find love. This is where we find joy. This is where we find peace. And this is what uh, in our, and affects our relationships. And this is how we see the, the working of God in our relationships, how we relate with one another. And truly... This is what every person is after. Think about in your life. If you do not have peace in your relationships, you really do not have peace. You may say, well, I know God loves me, but man, my relationships right now are messed up. I've got an argument going on here. I've got a, a, a breakdown in my family. My relationship with my children is a mess. My relationship with my spouse is upside down. My relationship at work, everybody hates me. There's no peace in that. You're not going to have peace. You might say, well, but God loves me. But there's a reason why you don't have peace in your relationships. There's a reason that that, that has become upside down. And that what we need to look at is are we obeying the truth? Are we following what Jesus' word says when we're finding our relationships are all upside down? When we're finding that we're struggling in our relationships, we need to take a step back and say, Lord, am I obeying what your word says? Am I following your truth? Am I obeying your truth? See, and, and Peter, what he's speaking to us here is he's telling us, this is what we have as Christians. We obey the truth. We follow him. And that's where we see the blessing come out of that. And that's where we see the goodness of God that is happening in our lives. Amen? So, our hope is made firm in him. Our faith is because it comes by hearing God's word. And because the truth that is in Christ, we come to know him by his word. Man does not live by bread alone. But he does live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen? Let's pray here before we get into 1 Peter. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you help us, that you open our ears to hear, that you open up our hearts to, to receive, that you open up our, our spirit, that you open up our soul, Lord God, to, to receive and that our souls would be quenched and satisfied by your word and by your life. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're here with us. You're the teacher. You're the one that helps us to remember what Jesus said. But God, guide my words today. Let my, not my words be from my flesh or from my own resource, but Lord, let me speak by the Spirit and help me in this and help us to hear by the Spirit today. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. First Peter Chapter 1, verse 22, if you want to open there in your Bibles or your Bible app. And he says here in verse 22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. He's saying since you have purified your souls by following him, all the things that Peter's been talking about in this, in this introduction to his letter, he talked about us being the elect. He talked about having a, a faith and a hope in him all upon Jesus. Well, now he's saying, since you've done all of this, you purified your souls. You purified, you're, you're making your soul, or God is making your soul in your obedience to be pure and to be a pure people as he has called us. He's saying, and then you have sincere love of the brethren. And that word sincere love is the word Philadelphia. It's a brotherly love. And he says, because you started doing that, he says, now love one another fervently with a pure heart. He's saying, because you've shown this brotherly love to each other, now have agape for each other. You've gone from brotherly love. This is what you've learned by purifying your souls. You, you, you have love for each other because you're being nice to each other. You're not getting in fights with each other. And so now I want you to go a step further is what, was what Peter is saying by the Holy Spirit, that you have sincere agape or love one another fervently with a pure heart. 
having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh, flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and its flower falls away. No one's promised us tomorrow, church. We're but a vapor. We're but a vapor. So if that's the case, why should we live for ourselves? Instead, we should follow what the Word of God says. We should have it with all sincerity, with all sobriety, to receive what the Word of God says. And it, verse 25 says, But the Word of the Lord endures forever. God's Word endures forever. Now this is the Word by which by the gospel was preached to you. And then the, the thought here is tied together in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, so we're going to stay in that. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious." Amen. Amen. That, there's a lot there. There's a lot there that, that the Apostle Peter is writing to you and I, readers of God's word, followers of Jesus. And so we need to unpack this here um, to understand because it's life for us. It's the word of God. It's, it's life for us. Now, Peter says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, understand that we're purifying our souls. We're obeying the truth of God's word. But the Holy Spirit is involved in our obedience to the truth. The Holy Spirit is involved in us understanding the word of God. The Holy Spirit is involved as we read, as we take it in, as you consume, as you eat the word of God, as you, you nourish your, your spirit upon God's word. The Holy Spirit is at work and in helping us to understand. It's the word of God, the logos, the seed, and the Holy Spirit working together in us. And it reveals itself not in living a perfect life. Understand this. It doesn't reveal itself because you live perfectly, because you say all the right things, because you do all the right things. That, that's not what reveals our obedience to the truth according to what Peter is saying here. He says, uh, um, well, let me, let, me say, let me say this. Peter says it reveals itself when we show sincere love for each other, when we show agape, an unconditional love for each other. And that's as God's people, that when you show this to your brothers and sisters in Christ, when you show a sincere love, when, you, when you're not burdened by your brothers and sisters, when you're not easily offended by your brothers and sisters in Christ, where you have grace where you show mercy towards each other. You know, it's not where you just go, man, I don't like the way they said that to me, and I'm all offended now. I don't like the way you talked to me when you said that. But instead, it's for us to have a sincere, an agape love, an unconditional love. So what that means is, in order to have an agape love, we've talked about this before, that's empowered by the Spirit of God. That's a supernatural love. We don't have agape on our own. That's right. Yeah, that's right. We, we, don't, we don't come. You, you, you come to Jesus. You receive the Lord. The Holy Spirit settles in you. But that agape love isn't there instantaneously. That's a supernatural love. We can have a brotherly love for each other. The world knows how to have brotherly love. Mm -hmm. It always fails. Mm -hmm. Right? It eventually wears out, in other words. There are some people out that, that do not claim Christ Jesus, but they're kind. Yeah. They're nice people. Yeah. They, they know how to, they have Philadelphia. That's what that word means. It's a brotherly love. That's why we call Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the city of brotherly love, whether that's true or not. Yeah. But how, it's how we love the way God says is it's empowered by the Spirit. That's empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's a supernatural love, right? And, but what Peter is telling us here, that this is the evidence according to the Spirit through Peter. This is how you know that God is working in you, that you're obedient to his word when you love each other, when you have an, a sincere love for one another, when you're able to love each other the way God loves you. 
And it reveals itself, right? Not, not in living perfectly. I want to stress that. Not in doing everything right. But by loving each other. By having mercy toward each other. By forgiving one another. And it starts in the church first. It starts in God's house first. You're not going to be able to do that out in the world and not do that in God's house. You can't say, well, you know, I go to church with these people, but I hate them. But I, I don't mind the people at the grocery store. It's because you don't know the people in the grocery store. And it is a love, according to Peter, that is fervent. It's hot like a blacksmith heating up metal where it becomes red and fiery. It's a fervent love. It's not a cold love. You know, when, you're, when your love is... When it's a fiery love, it's something you're thinking about, you're aware of, right? That means that, and as Christians, it's because we're empowered by the Spirit, where the Spirit of God is helping us to love one another, right? It flows from purity or sincerity of heart, not hypocrisy. You're not just putting up a facade. You're not just going, well, the Bible says that I need to love, so I'm going to pretend like I love you guys. You can start there, right? You can start there. But on our own, right, if we're doing it in the flesh, if we're doing it in our own strength, it's going to wear out. But that's where we've got to call out for mercy and say, God, and that's the point, is that we need to say, I can't do this on my own. You tell me in your word that this is how I'm to be with one another, but I, I can't do this in my own strength, so I need you. But I need your word. Your word is what's going to help me. I need to understand this, to take this in through the word of God, to, to see what God will do in me. It's in obedience to God's truth. And this is what produces a pure heart that loves God and loves their neighbor as themselves. It's the word of God that produces this, according to what Peter is telling us here in Peter 1. That, that th this is what produces a pure heart that loves God and loves our neighbor. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, we find this is truly the critique that Jesus had for the Ephesian church. Turn to your Bibles there, Revelation, chapter 2, and we're going to look here beginning in verse 1. And it says, to the angel or the messenger or the pastor of the church of Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Right? Jesus walks among the lampstands. The churches are the lampstands. That's why we know the Lord is here with us. God has set a lampstand at Life Church of Orange. Jesus is with us. Right? And this is where we see this. Jesus who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands because he's addressing the seven churches that were in Asia at the time that, that Jesus was addressing this. He says to the church of Ephesus, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have discovered them or found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Well, that's pretty good. That sounds like a pretty good church. They've endured. They haven't grown weary. They, didn't, they haven't given up. They're still proclaiming the name of Jesus. That sounds like a good church. But Jesus says this in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you. He says that you've left your first love. He says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Wow, that's a heavy critique. Yeah. Right? That, that's, those are some serious words there that Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, you're doing good in these things, but this is the one thing that you have fallen from, that you've forgotten. Return back to your first love. Return back to what you knew at the beginning. Notice, Jesus first commends the church for its good works, its labors. They're, they are patiently waiting Man, that's good. How many know it's hard to patiently wait? Yeah. And this is what Jesus says. You're doing this. 
to the church of Ephesus says, you're patiently waiting. You haven't given up. He says, you're keeping from evil all for my name's sake, is what Jesus says. So they're in a good place. That sounds like it. But he says this, nevertheless, I have this against you that you left your first love. You've forgotten your first love. You know, you come to Christ, you'll have everybody. As you're seeking the Lord, life starts to happen and get in the way. The storms of life start to come. Things, offenses happen. You, you realize that people, even though they call themselves Christians, still make mistakes, still hurt and wound. And, and that's the way it is because we're all growing. We're, we're not perfect, but we are to love one another and to forgive and to walk hand in hand and to be with each other and to grow with one another and to overlook our faults and to forgive and love and to grow strong together and understand that we're family, to understand that we're brothers and sisters, to understand there's no differentiation because of, I, 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 like, I think it was Pastor Glenn that said it earlier, right, that God's not concerned about skin color. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that shouldn't even be an issue in the church. And as your pastor, I got brown skin. I don't care what skin color you have. And I don't think you care about what skin color I have either. We love each other and we know that we're family. But we know that, that this is how God determined it to be. He chose this because the Bible tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully created. He has ordained how we look. And it's not what's going on on the outside either. God's looking at what's going on in our heart. Because when this life is over and we appear before him, when we see Jesus, the word of God tells us we're going to be as he is. So it's not even going to matter what this flesh is. This is just a tent that, that's wearing away. It's, it's just getting older. It's fading. It's, it's, a, it's breaking down. And that's okay. Because one day, this is all going to be new. Better than we could ever imagine. So, but, but understand my point here is that Jesus is saying, you've gone away from your first love. Repent and come back to those things that you did at first. Right? This is a very real issue for the universal church. We take our eyes off Jesus. The Ephesian church patiently endured much. They served much. They stood against evil, yet they lost their first love. Don't think that this can't happen to you or I. Don't think that this can't happen to us as the church, as God's people. Jesus describes our first love in detail from Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 33. It says this, Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is here, or is here, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And this is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you've spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. There's nothing more that you can do in your works greater than to love the Lord and to love your neighbor as yourself, is what he was basically following up what Jesus had said there. Our first love is to love him. But the Lord also says when answering the greatest or first commandment, that the second is equally important. And that is to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. Think about how you would love yourself. You, you're, you're concerned about how you look, hopefully, right on the outside. You're concerned about you want to feed yourself, right? All those things. And, and Jesus is telling us that, that what's most important along, that goes along with that is to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. 
If it's important to Jesus, it should be important to us. Many times it's the things that we miss right in front of us that are important to the Lord. The things that we do not think that we have a problem with sometimes are the very things the Lord wants to deal with. Things like strife, lying, hypocrisy, unforgiveness, envy, sometimes even malice. Things that you don't deal with when you are alone. When you're by yourself, you're not going to deal with those things. There's nobody to bother you. You're just going about your day, doing your own thing. Happy as can be. You run into somebody, talking to somebody, they hurt your feelings, now you're all bent out of shape. And they're your brother or sister in Christ. You won't know that you are selfish when you are alone or at least be called out for it. You won't realize that you're selfish when you're by yourself. And I understand too, husbands and wives, this applies to you. It's not just for the body of Christ, not just for, you know, the people sitting on the other side of the aisle in the church. It also applies to that one that's sitting right next to you. The call to obey the truth is most times revealed in us by our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it happens usually in our failings. It happens usually not in times that we're proud of. It's usually in times where we fail, we say things that we go, why, why did I say that? Boy, they just pushed my button and that just came right out of me. I didn't think that I, that was even possible inside of me. I, I, I love Jesus and I'm reading his word and that man, that came right out of me quick. That just shot right out of me. How did that even happen? They said something, and I, I shot right back with the quickest response. And I was thinking, nobody's going to get the best of me. I'm going to get the best of them. See, this is also reinforcing why the Lord said it is not good that man should be alone. We're not made to be alone. But also when we're together, it helps to bring out those things that are in us. Helps to reveal Right, These issues that God says, I, I want to work on this. This is what I'm, I'm perfecting you. I'm making you more and more like me. And this is something that I'm working out in us and working out in you and I. So without our love for the brethren, we could have a hypocritical love and not even know it. That idea, right? Well, if you're good to me, I'm going to be good to you. And, and if nothing, nobody offends anybody, if you don't offend me, then I'm good with you. Things are great. You, you don't do anything to insult me? Man, we're good. Look at the agape of God happening here. No. Just you haven't been, it hasn't been put to the fire yet. Right? There's been nothing that's stirred that up yet. Wait till that starts getting stirred up. That's going to be the, the, the test of our first love, staying in that place. That's what's going to reveal it. That's what's going to show what's going on inside of us when we're able to overlook the offenses. When we're able to overlook the, the, the maybe words that weren't, that we may have put this big idea, wow, they said this to me, and that person wasn't even thinking about that. They might have been thinking about what's going on during the week. They ignored me. They didn't say hi to me. Or they said hi to me, but they didn't say hi to me the way I like to be said hi to. <laughs> and, and I'm just using, you know, just real small examples, but it, it can get even a, a greater degree than that. Because an agape for your brothers and sisters, it flows out of a love for God. What losing our love for others reveals is no matter how we justify it, we have truly lost our first love for God. Because you cannot, you cannot say I love God and not love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Not love your husbands and wives. Not love your children. Not love your family. I know, we've got to think about it. Right, we've got to think about this one. Now, if the Ephesian church, where history tells us, had many of the major influences 
or influencers of the church at the time, the first century church, the Ephesian church, man, they had all the, the rockers. They had all the, the main dudes. It was founded by Paul, the apostle Paul. It, it was Timothy was their pastor for many years. And then later on, we know from history that the apostle John was pastoring and shepherding the Ephesian church. So you could say, man, they had great teachers. They had great influencers in the Ephesian church. They, they were receiving the word of God. They were probably hearing the best word that could ever be heard. But yet the Ephesian church struggled with their revelation of the love of God, with their understanding of the agape of God, that they couldn't continue in that. It also points to even if you read the Bible more, no matter how much you read, no matter how, no matter how much you, you pray, these are all good things. No matter how much you do all these actions, yet they still gave up loving one another as they did at the first. So we must humbly acknowledge in our own strength that we cannot do this on our own. Now, the Apostle Peter, he aligns all of this when he writes to us that we have the incorruptible seed in us by the word of God. So he's saying, but you have power. You have power, church. This is not a, this is not a oh, we, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get through this? No, he's saying you've got power inside of you. You have the seed. You have Christ, the word of God, Christ in us through his word, manifested by the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of Christ inside you and I as a believer, as a child of God, this, you have the spirit of God in you. Now, Christ, he's the logos. That is the divine expression or representation of God, right? You hear the word logos. That's where even in you and I and English, we get the word logical from the word logos. Okay, so we understand that, that he's the divine expression. He's the representation of God. He's the, the word made flesh, right? John 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. So we understand the word of God. That's Jesus Christ. He is God. Big G. Not a little G. Right? <laughs> he is the only God. He is not a God like the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. So that you cannot put your complete faith and trust in him. They say that he was a God. That's false. The word of God says that he is God. Right? But... The, so he brings us, uh, brings the light of men to us, everything that we need for life and living. And this is why Jesus says that if you've seen him, you have seen the father because they're one and the same. His seed produces new life in us always. The word and the spirit is how this happens. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So the word of God is where we get the, the renewing. We get that understanding, that regeneration. You're thinking God's thoughts, but also it is the renewal that is happening in you and I by the Holy Spirit. He's the one that does the renewing in you. He's the one that does the changing in us. That's why when we're, you hear us praying, we're saying, Lord, revive us. When you hear us saying, Lord, put a fire in us. Lord, awaken our hearts. We're praying because the word of God tells us that it's the Holy Spirit that does this. And so as and, and we, under, we see it in the word of God so that our faith can grow, that you can go to God's word and say, OK, Lord, this is what Titus 3, 5 says through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So I can be renewed. You ever have had a day where you're just like, Lord, help me. I feel so weak. I feel so worn out. I feel so devastated today. Well, that's where you go to the word of God and you speak it over your heart and mind. And you say, Lord, you say in your word that I am renewed by the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, begin to renew this mind. 
Begin to renew this heart. Begin to renew my thinking. Begin to make me more like you. This is the purpose and the plan in God. I know it. And so, Lord, this is what your word says. And I declare it by faith, even though I don't feel it right now. Even though my emotions are doing something else right now. But, Lord, I speak it over myself by faith. We should understand there is regenerating power in God's word. And it is not a one-time deal. And it is in conjunction with the spirit working in us. James 1.18 says this, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The word of truth is equivalent to new life. This is God's will. This is God's will that he brought you forth. This is God's will that he brought you forth by the word of truth. What he's doing inside of us, the renewing, the changing of our thoughts, the the making us more like him. It was his will to do this. John 1 13 says this, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You were born of the spirit by the will of God. This is what God wanted. God wanted you born again. He desired you. He called you, right? We've talked about this before. If you were the only one, he would have done it. We understand this is God's will. You're in this house because God wants you, because God desires you. You're in the plan of God because this is his will. This is his will for you. He wanted this to be done in us. You never have to question if you are his, When the word of truth is living in us, you remind yourself of this. You meditate on this. The incorruptible seed in us, the word of God, Christ Jesus. This is how we keep from the spiral of anger, a critical tongue, and the recurring cycle of anxieties, fears, and setbacks. See, this is how we do this. You know, we used to sing the song, This is How We Overcome. I don't know if some of you remember that or not, but we used to sing that song, This is How We Overcome. It was a hill song. song. But we got to understand, this is how we overcome. The incorruptible seed is in you and I. This is what Peter says. He is in us, and it is his, the seed, Christ Jesus, is incorruptible. It's never going to be corrupted. He's never going to be corrupted. That's never going to happen. And he is at work in us. And this is how we, we, are, we keep ourselves from this place of anger. Because it's relationship with him. It's renewing our minds. It's now thinking, looking to him, seeking him. It's that critical tongue. Man, that, that's, that's, that, that gets us, right? That, that you see it when somebody says something to you and you pew, get them right back. You're like, where did that come from? Man, I didn't even know that I could do that. Yes, you did just needed to be provoked, right? And that, and that cycle of worry, that cycle of, of fears, anxieties, right? As the flesh is put to death by the spirit, so does an awareness of sin and sin consciousness. Romans 8, 13 says this, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's where the world is right now, yeah. trying to resolve things in the flesh. And that doesn't work, and they try something else, and that doesn't work, and they try something else. You watch TV, watch television, all you see are drug commercials about problems people have and all the side effects that come, and they create new problems, so they have to take another drug to fix that side effect from the first problem that they had, and after a while, they've got all the... You know what I mean, right? It says, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So you pray in the Spirit... But you also respond with the word of God. Remember the example that Jesus gave us. He's being tested by the devil in the wilderness. He's being tested in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These are all the things, no matter what you deal with as a person, these are all the the categories that man faces, that people face in their temptations. And Jesus was no different. And how did he respond? He's filled with the spirit. We know that the spirit descended upon him like a dove. He goes into the wilderness. The spirit leads him into the wilderness. So he's being led by the spirit. 
Just like you and I are led by the Spirit, so he's full of the Holy Spirit, just like you and I are full of the Holy Spirit. But how does he respond? He responds with the Word of God. Just like you and I, this is how you put the, the flesh to death. That's why Paul says, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It's not trying to figure it out and do all. No, it's by the Spirit, and it's by the Word of God. As we relate to one another, we understand, okay, this is what the Word of God tells me. So if the Bible tells me that I should uh, um, be merciful that I will receive mercy, then I'm going to be merciful to my brothers and sisters, right? Well, but they completely ignored you. So what? The Word of God tells me to be merciful to them. Well, they said this about you. Shouldn't you? I'm going to be merciful. Because there's going to be a day where I need mercy. A lot of times we're not thinking about that. We're not realizing that there is going to come a day where we're going to need mercy. And as we've sown mercy, that mercy is going to come back. And let us be patient in it. Because you might be saying, well, I've been sowing mercy and I feel like no mercy has come back to me. Keep patient in it. It's going to happen because it's God's word. Peter says, when you obey the truth of God's word, this is how you become pure. And it is a process. It is how the spirit uses God's word in you to purify your mind to purify your heart, to produce the pure goal that God wants. Peter says obeying the truth of God's word is what purifies our soul. Got to hear that. It's the word of God that purifies our soul. Therefore, Jesus says in John 15, 3, you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Think about that. That's how Jesus looks at each and every one of us. He says, you're clean. You're clean because of the word that is in you, because of the word which I have spoken to you, because we've received the word of God. You're clean. When Peter was saying, you know, Lord, you know, you don't need to wash my feet. And he's like, well, if, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part of me. Then he's like, well, wash my head, too. Jesus saying, no, all you need to do is just wash your feet because the blood already covers you. You're already mine. We're already one. Nothing's going to take that away. If we're walking together. Nothing's going to take that away. And if we have that with Christ, we have that also with each other as God's people, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We're, we're walking together as well. So we're one. We're clean together. And he expands on this in John 17, 17. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. He says, make them holy by your truth. And what is his truth? That's God's word. And who is God's word? Jesus. Jesus made us holy by his sacrifice on the cross, confirmed as an accepted offering when he rose again from the grave. Right. So if you desire to worship God, you're going to obey his word. If you desire to seek him and follow him, you're going to obey his word. As Peter says, the same way that a baby desires and cries out for its mother's milk, let us also desire God's word in this manner. You know, most of you who have been parents, when that baby is crying for that milk, man, you're like, everybody get out of the way. I got to get that bottle. Get that baby that milk, right? If their, their diaper is clean, everything else, they need a bottle, right? And, and babies cry out. That doesn't mean that we're immature, but that means the way the baby cries out for the milk. That's the same way that we as God's people should desire always his word, that we should always uh, desire and, and uh, have that longing where, where it affects our heart, where we hear it, where we receive it, where we're glad, where we rejoice in it because it's the word of God. It's life to us. This is what we need. Now, this brings us to recognize that the power of God's word in our lives because God's word is both the logos and the rhema. That there is power in God's word to fulfill his purpose and promise in us. There is the logos where Jesus is the, the word became flesh, but also the rhema, the utterance of God, where the Holy Spirit is speaking to you through his word, where, where you're, you're receiving it. In this instance, the apostle Peter writes, but the rhema of the Lord, which is the utterance of God, where the Holy Spirit is speaking directly to you, 
and you, this is where you feel like when you're in church and the preacher, you think the preacher is talking to you. And you're going, how did the preacher know what's going on in my life this week? Well, the preacher doesn't know. It's the Holy Spirit convicting you. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's the rhema of the word of God in action in your life. See, this is where the life of God is breathing into your circumstance, into your situation. See, one word from God changes everything. I've always found that in my life when I, I, I seek God and I'm, I'm trying to hear what he's saying. And the spirit of God and his mercy and his goodness speaks to me. And that changes the situation, changes the circumstance. He's breathing life into us as we read the word through the Holy Spirit, just as God spoke life into you and I in the beginning. Right. In Genesis 126, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is the spoken word. Right. That this is the logos. Jesus is the word of God. And then Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. He breathed the breath of life into man, Adam. Then eventually he did the same in Eve. And in the same way, church, it is the power of God, the life of God, which is the light of men, everything that you and I need, activated in us by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We should therefore make it a habit to ask the Holy Spirit to understand when we read God's word. You know, when I open up in prayer, I'm asking, Holy Spirit, teach us. Teach us what we're about to read here. And, and I do that because th that's what I do when I read. But also because I want us to get that understanding. When you're reading the word of God, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Don't just read it for reading's sake, but engage the Spirit of God because he's right there with you as you're reading the word of God. And if you do that, praise God. But if you don't, I want to encourage you. Begin to do that. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you because he's the teacher. He's the one that helps us to remember what Jesus said. And so as you read the word of God, say, Holy Spirit, help me understand here. Holy Spirit, help me receive what you're wanting to tell me today by the word of God, that I can take that in my heart, that I can live off of this today, that I can have daily bread for my spirit today as I'm going about what I need to do, and I'm going to have the life of God to be able to do what I need to do in this day that you've graced me. Amen? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, but his word is the word of the gospel. If we struggle with obeying the truth, if you, if you struggle with following what his word says, how do we come back to loving others? What Jesus commanded, we must go back to the gospel. We must remind our heart what Jesus has done for ourselves. We must remind our hearts what Jesus did for us. If I'm struggling in loving others, man, let's be real. What if, what if you're saying, man, they, this person really hurt me? And, and I have a hard time just not hating them. We must come back to the gospel. Because Jesus doesn't hate us. We were his enemies. We, before, we were his enemies. We must come back to the gospel. We must remember that he said, Father, forgive them. Because they do not know what they're doing. We must come back to what Christ has done for all of us. That God so loved you and I that he gave up his only begotten son, that he gave up Jesus in our place, that we would not perish. We deserve to perish, but we will not perish, but instead we will have everlasting life. Amen. 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 And we must come back to the gospel. We must come back to this understanding. Something has happened inside of us if we, if we struggle with forgiving, if we struggle with loving, if we struggle with doing what Jesus says. When people say that the gospel is no longer relevant, something's become broken, wounded, where a person has become seared. And only the Lord can heal this. And if not, this is where people walk away from the truth. 
Because the gospel of Christ is preached by the rhema of God. That's what Peter said. He said that this gospel, right, this gospel of Christ is preached by the, by the rhema of God. This is what Peter is writing when he says it endures forever. It's the rhema of God that endures forever because it's the spoken word to you. It lives it lives inside of you. The word of God by the spirit lives in you. This, these are the words that, that God has spoken to you that you, I know that you love me. This is where God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And you read that and you say, God, thank you. You're never going to leave me or forsake me. This is when you read the word of God and it speaks life to you where he's, and it speaks directly to your problem, directly to your issue. Well, yes, the word is alive, but that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's the rhema, and that's what's going to endure forever. Some people take it literally, and their Bible gets damaged, and they're like, no, I can't get rid of this Bible because it's the word of God, and it's supposed to endure forever. It's just a physical object. It's paper. Yeah. What, it in, what is contained in it, yes, is life, but this is just, a, just an object. Not, this object isn't going to endure forever. And I got plenty of Bibles that are falling apart. But understand the word of God. That's, we're going to have that forever. When we're in eternity, a million years have gone by. We're still going to have the word of God. Eternal. Word of the Lord endures forever. And it's that spoken word because many times we need to carry that word that we find in the word of God and the Holy Spirit confirms that in you and that's what we carry into life that we endure through. Maybe that God speaks to you, you, you read in the word of God. You know, Becky uh, was sharing something with us during the week that she saw in the Old Testament and it just brought great encouragement. And many times it's, we carry those words with us. We say, Lord, thank you. Thank you, that's your promise. And the Spirit of God is speaking to you and he says, I'm with you. I'm going to defend you. I'm going to protect you. I'm your covering. I'm your shelter. I'm your hope. I'm your strength. I'm the one that's going to redeem you. I'm the one that's going to turn things around for you. You may have felt devastated, but I'm going to turn that around and I'm going to bring strength to you. And it's going to be a testimony that I, it's going to be proved out in your life. And you hold on to that. That's the rhema. That's the word of the Lord that endures forever. And it lives big in you. And that's God, his activation. That's the activation of the spirit. And that's why many times we need to speak that over our lives. That's why it's good to memorize those scriptures. Right? We defeat ourselves when the Holy Spirit uses that word and then we can't remember what it is. Because we don't take the time to memorize that. We don't take the time to put that on a, on a placard or something or just write it down on a note and put it on your refrigerator or put it on your dashboard in your car or put it in your, your Bible or, or put it on your phone, on the, the wallpaper of your phone, whatever you do, whatever you look at. Because you want to keep that, you want to meditate on the word of God because it's alive, it's living in us. And as we grow in that, seasons change, seasons come and go. There's going to be more in God's word that's going to speak to you. And there's going to be another scripture that's going to come. And the life of God is going to come out of that. But it's going to be because of the victory that happened from what you started with. Is this making sense to anybody? Yes. Ephesians 2.1 tells us this. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. For the child of God he made us alive. Our spirit never grows old but we will become dull if we walk away from obeying the truth. Yet the flesh and the ways of the flesh can never produce the love of God. You know, sometimes you may feel like you're at just a, a, a breaking point. You may feel like, man, I'm trying to not get mad at this person. But I'm going to tell you, whatever the issue might be, letting your flesh have its way is never going to produce the love of God in you. It's never going to produce what God is, is working at in you. If we have indeed tasted that the Lord is good, if we really have had our souls purified by the word of truth, if we really have the spirit of God in us, if we are truly children of God, let us love one another as Jesus has said. After all, it's his power that works in us to follow him. John 15, 11 through 12, we're going to close with this. He said this, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. We all want his joy in us. 
I want his joy in me. I want his joy to remain in me. He says, these things, this is what I'm telling you, that your joy may be full. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's the Holy Spirit working in his people to obey the truth. We have the seed in us, God's word, which can never be corrupted. Our souls made pure by his word and by which we can love one another. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and let's pray here. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that life is in your word. Thank you that man doesn't live by bread alone, but he does live by every word that proceeds from you, what you're speaking to us, what you're showing us, and it's by your word in us. Holy Spirit, you take that and you, you're making it alive in us. You're helping our hearts to grow in it. God, I pray for each one here today. I pray that their ground has been good ground, that they've heard the word today, that they would not discard it, that it would not fall along the wayside, that there would not be thorns that it would be caught up in, that it would not be stony ground, but, Lord, that we would all be good soil and that we receive this word, this seed would grow in us and that we would produce fruit. We would produce fruit to glorify you, to, to bring you glory, Lord God, as your word tells us. This is how my Father is glorified when we bear much fruit. So, Lord, help us to bear much fruit from your word. Help us to grow in you. Help us to be who you've called us to be. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, I want to just uh, address anybody here who's heard this word today. I know we're family here in the house of God, but if there's anybody that might be watching online, if you, you've heard this message, you, you may have dropped in, you may have tuned in, you may have been listening to us, watching us regularly, and the Holy Spirit is convicting you today because you've never really made Jesus the Lord of your life. So, this is an invitation to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to understand that he has forgiven you of all your sins. If you would come to him, if you would say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. I want to be yours. I don't want to live my old way anymore. I'm tired of the cycle of anxiety. I'm tired of the anger. I'm tired of this critical mouth. I'm tired of just this cycle of life that never changes. It's always frustration. Only Jesus can give you true peace. Only Jesus can bring rest to your soul. It doesn't mean that your life is going to be perfect, but it does mean that your soul will finally find rest in him. So this invitation is for you. If there's anybody here that says, I don't know Jesus, as my Lord and Savior, and I desire, or to desire to receive his forgiveness today. I desire to, I'm done with this, and I repent, and I call upon the Lord Jesus. If that's you today, just raise your hand, and we're going to pray for you. Amen. Amen. What I want you to do here, we've got one hand here that's raised in the auditorium. I want everybody to agree here. We're all going to pray together. Would you all repeat after me? Lord Jesus, I ask that you forgive me. I ask that you cleanse me. And I commit to following you. I ask you to help me every day. Help me to take in your word. Help me to understand. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're filling me right now. Your presence is changing me. You're changing my heart. You're making all that hurt go away. What was broken is now being made whole. I thank you. My name is written in your book of life. And I'm yours forever. 
In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So if you agreed and you believed that word, you're now a child of God. Amen. Amen. God is working in you. And this is where you let the word of God, this is what you feed off of, this is what you grow in. For you online, if you don't have a church family, we invite you. If you're not a part of a church and you're, you've received the Lord, get in a church that teaches the Bible, that teaches about Jesus, that preaches the gospel, that preaches the truth of God's word. And if you live locally, you live close by, come and see us. And we'd be glad to have you join us and be a part of the family. You know, as a privilege in this church, we celebrate communion every week. Because it is a privilege. If you call yourself a child of God, we have this place. When we come to the Lord's table or communion, we're gathering to him. This is an assembly point. This is a place where we're coming and gathering together. It is his table, his body. It's his blood is what we're remembering. At the Last Supper, the Lord Jesus said, This is the new covenant in my blood. And in doing so, he was fulfilling what the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Amen. This is the covenant that you and I have. God does not remember your sin, church. This is the relationship that you and I have with the living God because of what Jesus has done. We are a part of Israel. We are spiritually, we've been grafted into the vine. We also have a portion in this. We all has also have a part in this. The body and the blood of Jesus is the new covenant sacrifice. And here, we've all come to gather together this assembly as the family, as the church family. And we partake of the sacrifice of the covenant that Jesus has done. The perfect sacrifice once and for all. Here, we remind ourselves of the covenant. In this place, here, we renew our commitment to him. We renew our commitment to each other as God's people, as the family. And we renew our commitment to remembering what Jesus has done for us, his precious sacrifice, how he gave up his body. He forsook his body for us. He took on all the sin of the world for us and his blood was shed for us that we would stand before the living God pure and accepted before him. Amen. So with thanksgiving, take the bread and break and eat it. And with thanksgiving, take the cup and drink of it. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for what you're doing in us. Thank you for what you're working in us. Thank you for your goodness in us, Lord God. We remember, we do not forget, as your church, as your people, we remember your goodness. We remember, we have tasted that you are gracious. And Lord, we love each other as we love you. In your name, amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, one uh, before Becky and Jordan lead us out here this morning or this afternoon now, 
This Thursday, we're going to do something different. We are going to be uh, live streaming our Thursday night Bible study at 7 o'clock. So we are going to have the doors open. If you want to come this Thursday night, uh, we'll be here. We're going to have a Bible study. Go from 7 to 8. You're welcome to come join us. We are going to be streaming online on uh, Facebook as well as it will be on YouTube that you can watch as well. But we invite you to come on out and be with us. It's time to get things back to normal in God's house. Amen. And so this is one step that we're making towards that. So we welcome you to come on out. Becky and Jordan, you guys are awesome. You're such a blessing to the church family. Would you lead us out as we close today? Have a great week in God. Amen.